Thanks, Jay. Let me see if I can just get my screen shared real quick. And hopefully everyone can see that presentation now. Great, wonderful. Um, so hello, welcome to our MS Echo. I'm so glad that everyone could be here to join us. My name is Lauren Ruiz. I'm a senior program manager with the Institute for Public Health Innovation, and I lead the Rural MS Solutions Project um, here at the organization. My background actually really is rooted in navigation for people living with complex chronic conditions. I've worked in nonprofits for about 15 years now, and that entire time has really been spent in this space. Um, I've previously ran a patient assistance organization leading over 25 case managers that helped provide information and referral services and direct navigation services um, to thousands of people nationwide. And my background is rooted um, specifically in insurance navigation. Um, so I'm really excited about this topic today, um, navigating multiple sclerosis and how we can help the community better access resources. So today we're going to talk about really two different settings in which someone may be navigating this disease and all of the symptoms and additional resources that they may need in addition. These can be both clinical settings and community settings. As you can see amongst the groups, um, there might be some crossover here and there in the settings, but generally you have your clinical navigators as doctors, nurses, social workers, um, official paid patient navigators or care coordinators, clinical trial navigators, patient advocates or case managers. These are folks who are typically engaging with a patient or a caregiver in some type of clinical setting, but may also be providing assistance in navigating to other needed resources related to social determinants of health. We also have our community navigators. This is going to be that individual out in the community, more on their own or one on <clears throat> one on one, who is really trying to navigate those day to day needs that are popping up. This, of course, um, is that person living with MS, one of the primary navigators um, to find resources. Caregivers, of course, also provide a lot of support um, to their person in navigating resources and, and finding um, needed services. We hear from the community a lot um, that a great source of resources is their support group. So this is another member of their support group who has an experience or who has had a similar need um, recommending a resource to them. You'll see similar relationships with community members, community health workers, faith-based personnel, or other professionals in the communities like librarians or barbers who may be having interactions with people in need of a service related to their MS, either directly or indirectly, and providing some type of guidance or direction to connect them to a resource. I'll talk about um, community navigation a little bit more first, but our featured guest today, Suzanne, is going to expand more on that topic. So I'll also talk about clinical navigation, and then we'll end with a brief discussion on a community clinical integrated approach, which I think people on this call may already be utilizing or could be really interested in exploring. So the first topic is community navigation. Uh, we know that there are definitely some general advantages and potentially disadvantages to this type of approach. Um, some of the advantages are that it is self-driven. So there is some type of 
commitment already established with the person living with MS, um, that this is a resource that they're in need of and that they're interested in finding help or support for it. There also is that level of existing trust. If it is a family member, a community member, a faith-based personnel that they have that trusted relationship with, there is going to be that built-in trust in that recommendation and in that follow-through. And often these recommendations are made off of personal experience. Um, and so that can often be really reassuring and comforting for someone going into a resource to know that they have a direct connection with someone who has had a good experience. Some of the disadvantages um, are that it's self-driven. <laughs> there is not really necessarily any direction. Um, people could just be sort of languishing and not really sure what to do next or where to go. The resources could be unvetted. Um, they could be something that isn't the best fit for the individual's needs. And often with this type of navigation, we're really being reactive. The individual already has a concern or a need that has arisen, and that is what is spurring them to seek out more information or to seek out help. So our biggest challenges here in community navigation tend to be awareness. Just how do we find the resource? How do we know what we need? How do we connect with it? And usability. Once they find the resource, can they really access it and can they maintain it? Those two things are really important. So these are some of your most common community navigation resources. Um, I think we're all very familiar with Dr. Google, and that is typically the first place that people go to start locating resources. Many people, as I mentioned, also rely on those word of mouth connections. So that could be in person through those support groups or through those direct one on one relationships. Um, as our world changes, this has also grown to include social media and patient forums where they may be interacting and receiving that word of mouth recommendation. There are several um, search engines that are specifically focused on resources addressing social determinants of health and related needs um, to a condition. There's findhelp.org, which is a really common um, search engine previously known as Aunt Bertha. There's needymeds.org, which focuses on specific medications, geography, and conditions. There's need help paying bills, which it can be categorized geographically or by topic and pro provides a breadth of resources um, related to financial assistance. Nationally, there's 211 and United Way, which can connect folks to more localized resources through categorized topics. In Virginia, we have a statewide resource through Virginia Navigator that can can provide navigation services and connection to medical and social related needs. There's Senior Navigator, Disability Navigator, and Veterans Navigator as a part of that network. I'll talk a little bit more about this organization later on um, when I speak about a tool that we're developing um, in partnership with them. And one really great um, tool to highlight for this community in particular is the MS Navigator Program through the National MS Society. Um, this is a great starting place for folks living with MS and caregivers who are interested in finding healthcare providers with MS specific knowledge in their area um, for education resources, for support groups. These navigators are available um, through chat, through email, through phone, and can really help um, someone early in their MS journey or um, a little bit later on who has a specific need or concern to navigate um, to those resources. So moving forward into clinical navigation, um, similarly, oftentimes some advantages and disadvantages that we may see here 
Um, some of the advantages are that these resources are going to be professionally guided. So in addition to having a resource that is relevant to the need being expressed, there are typically going to be some identified next steps for the individual to take. And that can help with that connection and access issue um, that we often run into. In clinical navigation, there often is more opportunity to be a little bit proactive in identifying some of these concerns. There are social determinant of health risk assessments and other tools that can be used in clinical settings to really cover a range of topics that at times in that setting, in that environment, with whatever is going on in their mind at the top of it, the patient or the caregiver may not be thinking about all of those items and they may miss something that a real comprehensive assessment could catch and could connect someone to resources earlier. And of course, there's always the opportunity here for resources to be more medically tailored and appropriate. So an example of this would be if an individual living with MS is seeking more guidance about nutrition for their disease. If they're finding these resources on their own, there are a lot of resources out there nowadays labeled and sold as nutrition. And that may not be the best resource in every case for a person living with MS. So a resource provided by a nutritionist, by a medical professional that's really taking into consideration the specific MS needs could be a really big advantage when we talk about navigating to certain resources. There can also, in some instances, be certain disadvantages or barriers to this type of navigation. In some cases, patients may not feel as though they have that built-in trust with their provider. This oftentimes can just be an issue of time or resources available. Not every provider has a case manager or a patient navigator in their office, and not every provider or every patient takes that time to build that trust and patient relationship and have that opportunity. There can also, as we know, be some communication barriers. The language that is being used by people living with MS may be different than the language that's being used in a clinical setting. And so you may see some issues in an individual being able to really communicate what their needs are and for that to be understood. And then on the flip side, if that is understood for those resources to be communicated in a way where that individual understands what the purpose of them is and what their next steps are. And then of course, just simply the clinical environment itself can introduce some barriers. Some individuals simply don't feel their best in these settings and they may be there because they're not feeling their best at that moment. So it can oftentimes just be hard to have these conversations and to have someone be fully present and focused on maybe social needs when they might have something else on their mind or just wanting to get out of that doctor's office. So thinking about some of those most common resources for clinical navigation, I mentioned that there are tools um, created and designed specifically to um, assess social determinants of health. These can be really useful in the clinical setting, as I mentioned, to cover a full range of topics related to social determinant of health or health-related social needs, and really make sure that we're covering all of those topics with the individual and not missing any resources that could be vital. Many um, clinical settings have some type of resource directory integrated into their EMR. In Virginia, we have an add-on system called No Wrong Door, which is powered by UNITAS, a resource directory system. Uh, there are social services programs and benefits that are often coordinated through clinical settings, think referrals to Medicaid, um, referrals to social security, disability, things of that nature. Many offices 
businesses take the time to curate a local set of resources. Uh, the challenges that come with this, of course, are keeping that up to date. <laughs> And one topic or that we'll talk about a little bit more later on um, in more detail is contracted referral partnership. So this is some type of relationship, most likely between a clinical and community-based setting where the clinician is able to identify a concern and immediately refer someone to a partnered, trusted organization to provide that specific need. So one thing that we do need to keep in mind um, in all of these settings, and as we are looking to help an individual navigate multiple sclerosis, is that there are some barriers that we may face both on the medical and the social side. On the medical side, we have individuals who are dealing with symptoms of fatigue, anxiety, depression, pain, mobility limitations, and in some cases, impairments to their cognitive abilities, such as processing, managing, and organizing. And so when we think about handing someone a long list of resources and asking them to do a lot of work to follow up on, vet, connect with, become eligible for, apply, access, and maintain a resource, that even just sounds like a lot. And doing it when you're facing these symptoms and these challenges can be really overwhelming. And so thinking about how we can create and design processes for information and referral services and for navigation services that are taking into consideration that the counterpart in that conversation is likely dealing with some of these symptoms. We also have some um, social barriers that we could potentially address. When we're thinking about resources that we are recommending or referring someone to, you can think about things like, will it require transportation and is that available? What is the cost if there is one and is that affordable? Does it require some type of use of technology? And does my individual have those skills and feel comfortable? How much time is this going to take? Is there a specific association with the disease? For some patients, while they may recognize that they've been diagnosed, they don't necessarily associate as a person living with MS every day and think about that. And so they may not be finding themselves in these MS-specific settings or comfortable in those spaces. So how can we think about alternative resources that can also provide um, help with those same services? So as you are um, designing or implementing any type of service or support to help an individual address their social determinants of health, Think about how you can decrease barriers to one, two, five, or all of these things, because that's really going to ease that burden and make that navigation process a lot more successful. So I'll quickly touch on a tool that um, we are developing through our Rural MS Solutions Project in collaboration with Virginia Navigator. This is a resource map that spans our four state region of Maryland, North Carolina, Virginia, and West Virginia. And it does um, consider both the health and social needs of people living with MS. These resources have been curated through a series of convenings and conversations with MS stakeholders and allies and people living with MS and caregivers to make sure that we are prioritizing the resources most relevant and most important to their needs. The individual goals of this tool are to increase that opportunity to identify relevant resources and remove additional noise. This tool also provides a first level of resource vetting, making sure that the, the um, resource is available, that it is a, a real resource and can be trusted, and that it's currently active. 
Um, and really what we're looking to do here is provide more opportunity for people living with MS and caregivers to find resources that can give them more time, money, energy, confidence, and connection as they navigate their disease. There are also some system goals that this tool can help um, to support. With a quick glance through the visualization tool, we can do things like maximize community resources, reduce replication of services, and increase collaboration. Um, so this is really something that we're looking to see where gaps exist and where there may be over or underutilized resources in certain communities to improve that network effectiveness. I can give you all just a very brief look at the tool itself. So there's quick navigation on the top. If I'm a new patient and I'm looking for patient support, I can click on that. And like I said, it will disappear all of that noise. So that individual can really focus on those services that are most relevant to them. Once you find an organization that you're interested in, you can click on that and it'll bring a profile card up that will provide more information. Uh, this is just a prototype. We are getting ready to release the full version of this map, which covers the four state area. And each profile card covers about 75 data points to help individuals or um, professionals make decisions about relevancy um, and access for resources. One way that we are implementing this tool is through navigation centers in rural communities throughout our four state region. So these centers have a multi-purpose function. Um, they can host that network map and provide that resource navigation. Some will act as telehealth sites. Some will have community health workers or trained navigation experts on site to provide that more um, in-depth one-on-one support. And they'll be able to bring awareness and education about MS to the community. So a few ways that you can get involved with this work is if you are interested in access to the network map, it will be available on our website when that's launched, or you can reach out to the Rural MS Solutions team. If you're interested in hosting access to the network map at your community-based site, we can provide technical assistance like tablets, Wi-Fi hotspots, stipends, trainings, et cetera. Or if you're interested in serving as a navigator center, um, again, reach out to the Rural MS team and we can provide some support in getting you set up to host those services. So the topic that I wanna leave us on um, is a way for organizations who are interested in providing support for social determinants of health and resource connection to really start thinking about implementing these services and providing them directly through their organization. And this is through um, a subset of the public health workforce, community health workers. So a very brief 101 um, about community health workers for anyone who isn't familiar. A community health worker is a frontline public health worker who is a trusted member of and or has an unusually close understanding of the community served. This trusting relationship enables the worker to serve as a liaison between health and social services and the community to facilitate access to services and improve the quality and cultural competence of service delivery. So you can see here some of the titles or common um, titles for CHWs. And you can see um, a brief um, description of the work that CHWs do, which is focused on increasing health literacy and encouraging self-sufficiency. So building community capacity and individual resiliency. And that is through services such as navigation, outreach, education, social supports, advocacy, and more. 
So when we think about our current CHW landscape, most community health workers are currently funded through grants. These are grants maybe through um, state or federal government programs or often through private philanthropy. Currently in our four state region that we've um, been focusing on, again, in Maryland, North Carolina, Virginia, and West Virginia, um, none of these states have um, full coverage or reimbursement for CHWs through Medicaid. North Carolina is working on that. And in West Virginia, CHW services are covered specifically through the Drug-Free Mom and Babies Program. But we really want to see more availability and access to CHWs and more sustainability for this workforce. So one really exciting rule recently came out that community-based organizations and providers can really start taking advantage of to receive reimbursement for providing these services to your patient communities. Because like I said, I know that even if you aren't recognizing it, and even if you don't have a formal model in place, many, if not all of you, are probably providing some type of health-related social needs support to your communities. So why does this rule matter? This rule is really important for organizations working with employing or seeking to implement community health workers to provide services to Medicare beneficiaries. It is providing for the first time direct reimbursement for CHW services by creating new codes for activities addressing health-related social needs. It is another step forward in their recognition of the work and value of these types of roles and the impact that can come from providing social support services. So this 2024 rule, if utilized, can increase sustainability pathways for the CHW workforce, and really importantly, encourage that increased clinical integration of CHW services through direct employment or partnerships with community-based organizations. So Medicare has defined a set of services related to activities addressing health-related social needs. Um, these can be done through a social determinant of health risk assessment, community health integration services, and principal illness navigation services. In theory, the implementation um, of the CHI and PIN services are very, very similar. Um, it really is just the populations that we're talking about here. So providers are able to bill Medicare, um, who are able to bill Medicare can deliver CHI and PIN services. This is what's really important. These providers can also partner with community-based organizations to deliver CHI and PIN services on their behalf. Medicare does not specify training requirements or number of training hours for CHWs delivering these services, so that's really left up to each state. Um, general supervision is required, meaning that the billing provider does not directly need to oversee the personnel delivering the services, but just have some level of integration to ensure the services being provided are related to their treatment and that they're being documented in the medical record. So for instances um, where your organization is providing these services and serving this, these populations, this is an opportunity to really establish some intentional partnerships between community-based organizations and clinical um, sites in your community and provide those um, services related to health-related social needs or social determinants of health and provide that full comprehensive care that our communities are looking for. So this has been the quickest overview of this rule that has ever existed, but you'll receive access to 
these resources. Um, so these are some additional resources that can really help you to understand these benefits and the related rules. Um, the third one in particular is a copy of a presentation given by the Partnership to Align Social Care. Their organization's mission is enabling successful partnerships and contracts between healthcare and community care networks. So they have a really comprehensive overview and deep dive into um, some case studies and some examples and some really detailed um, tools for implementing these types of services and taking advantage of this rule. Um, and finally, if you have any specific questions related to CHW models, implementation, billing, or navigation, um, please reach out. The Institute for Public Health Innovation is here to help, and we are happy to answer questions, provide additional resources, or offer whatever assistance we can to your organization. Um, and Jay, am I ready to kick it straight over to our lovely Suzanne now? Sure. I mean, let's pause. Does anybody have any just any initial thoughts or questions before we move on? I see that... Um, Michelle was updating the group about the work that's being done in West Virginia, which has been great. I think hearing none, we can we can go ahead and transition, Lauren. So go for it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jay. Um, so I would like to introduce Suzanne. Suzanne is a resident of a rural county in Virginia, a proud veteran of the US Navy a person living with multiple sclerosis, the founder and president of the Multiple Sclerosis Alliance of Virginia, a trusted community leader, advocate, friend, and more. Her journey with MS started in the early 70s, but she didn't know it at the time. Her diagnosis in 1983 introduced her to a new community, one which she herself would eventually have a great impact on and help to transform. Today, Suzanne is just a call, text, or email away for the hundreds of people impacted by MS that she helps support through MSAB. I am really thrilled that she is able to join us today and share her experience and deep understanding of navigating MS in a rural community. Everyone, Suzanne O'Connell. I'll, I'll unmute. Thank you. Gosh, you make me sound so good. I'd rather hear you just keep talking about me. That sounded wonderful. Um, it is a lot of work what we've done, and a lot of what you've put up on the screen is um, relates to to that. So you, you've kind of told my story already. I'm a mother of three grown boys and a few grandbabies and um, people that, like everybody, that don't, doesn't really understand MS. And um, so it's anything that we can do to help with the education, especially of our providers, is uh, exciting to us. We do, our, our organization, um, started, I'm, I just nutshell it real quick. Um, I was asked about 12 years ago if I would take over a little failing support group in Roanoke. And I live, when she says rural, I live rural. I live very deep in the woods in Floyd County, Virginia. Um, and so when they asked me if I wanted to take over a support group, I'd never really gone to support groups. I didn't want to go to them. I visited one when I was young and newly diagnosed, and it didn't look like anything that was of interest to me. It scared me to death and made me realize that's not where I wanted to be. And so when they asked me if I wanted to take over this little group, which was basically five old people, and I was one of them, um, I said, no, thank you. I, I really don't. I live in Floyd, and I've looked a long time to find sanity, and I've I don't want to go to run up to do anything. Now I hung up the phone and I started thinking, well, that sounded kind of rude. And so I called them back and said, I, I really apologize for that. Um, <clears throat> you know, tell me more and let's talk about it. So I agreed to do it for two years. Well, that was 12 years ago. And um, 
I was in marketing prior. So I marketed our group like I would market anything I believed in. And if I was going to be the person that was going to take the group over, uh, first I had been, it had been highly recommended to me to keep the group independent, meaning <clears throat> that it wasn't owned by one of the larger organizations. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Multiple Sclerosis Foundation, MSF, has a wonderful network of independent support groups. And so we followed their guidance to set up the group independent. And again, I marketed it everywhere I knew to market it, uh, reaching into all the neurologists, all the therapists, and everywhere I could, getting people involved and getting the word out there. A lot of doctors didn't think highly of support groups, and I can understand why at one point, because I didn't want to go to a cry fest, and I didn't want to create one. Um, what we do is primarily ex education. Education is the biggest thing of all to us, um, getting people out. I call what happens to me with my MS um, a cocoon. When I don't feel well, I'll go into a little cocoon. This week, I've been in one of my cocoons because I attended the CMSC in Nashville last week, and I was more behaved than I've ever been in my life, and I still got worn out. And so I'm like, well, I might as well just have fun and partied with everybody else because maybe I could have fun too, but I learned a lot. And um, there's so much going on with MS right now. So another goal of ours is to get people out. Um, I, I, I know that telemedicine looks different now, but about eight years ago when I was at CMSC before, I uh, approached the veterans booth and the lady said, oh, oh, I've heard about you. I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Whoever. And I'm like, oh, I'm anxious to meet anybody. Oh, he the doctor who's trying to uh, get telemedicine more out you know for veterans and I'm like oh yeah I really do want to meet him telemedicine is the worst idea on earth um, if you want to finish killing people with MS you know give them telemedicine and then they'll never leave home and we'll all be in this little couch potatoes together and the lady was just shocked and I don't know if she wanted to introduce me to Dr. So-and-so after that but we did meet and I did explain to him why I feel so strong about that because there were four years of my life that I was homebound, basically bedridden. I didn't stay in my bed. I stayed on my couch or whatever. And I did pretty much nothing and I'm not a nothing person. And the only thing I left for during those four years was my doctor appointments and an occasional ride in the car, but that was it. So I think that doctor appointments are very important. Um, in that respect, I also see that I'll, some of the things that you went over, and I, I don't want to jump around, but you know, some of the things I've noticed with people with our organization is everybody isn't totally open with their doctors. And a lot of times we can come into that picture too. So going back to us, we started our little group and um, it was again, five old people. And our first meeting was 12, basically 12 people on a very, very cold, icy night in Roanoke. And they had their meetings at the time uh, in a wing of the psych center. I'm like, okay, that just does not look attractive either. So I wanted to change the location, make it a cheerier place, something that was more welcoming to anybody. So we uh, were able to get our meetings to where we met at a at a Holiday Inn, which was great because if someone thought, well, I want to go to a support group meeting and they walked in and they changed their mind, nobody even ever knew they were there. And we actually met people that were just sometimes going to the bar or traveling and they would see our signs. So we started out as just the Little Roanoke support group. And that first month, 12 people, the next month we had 25. And all of a sudden each month it started doubling seriously. And by August of that year, I, um, I'm not afraid of much of anything. I've even invited Willie Nelson to come to our group, and I hope he does someday. 
but I'll invite anybody. The worst thing you can do is tell me no. And um, so we have great speakers. And um, I had heard there was a new doctor coming to town at the time. And we're very um, underserved in this area. Seriously underserved. We don't, we now do have two neurologists, but this is a big area. And to find a specialist, you had to go all the way to Charlottesville, which is, uh, you know, a few hours away, a couple hours away, especially for me. And um, and then all the pain of trying to find a place to park and all this stuff you have to do at UVA. Um, so I heard this new doctor was coming from Maryland. So I was able to find a way to get in touch with him and um, asked him if he would speak to our group. So we actually scheduled him to speak at our group before he even assumed his role at Carillion when he was coming there to start a new MS center, which did not work at that time. But so at that meeting, we all of a sudden had a hundred people at a support group meeting, not beginning to know what in the world we were gonna do with that many people. Um, we didn't have any money um, for refreshments or anything, but met, somehow made it happen. And believe it or not, for us, that's been an ongoing problem. We have too many people. Um, we COVID came along and like everybody, our numbers went way down. But so after about two years of the growing, we needed we needed money um, and the money would come in little bits and pieces, which was fine. That's all we needed. But we also needed a way to handle that. And I didn't want to be, I didn't want to have to be accountable for when somebody just hand me money or something like that. And um, I won a television at an event and I tried not to claim it because I was at an MS event and my kids were, mom, you won. I'm like, no, 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 no. Quite. But anyway, I won the television. So I, donated it back to the group we raffled it and we ended up that's how we made eight hundred dollars with that eight hundred dollars we decided we could start a nonprofit, and um so we made some got us some cards and t-shirts and the things you do to just keep on growing um but then we didn't have enough money when we got to the bank to start our checking account which was interesting and uh so we had a lawyer in our group and she helped us uh, get to a law firm to create the nonprofit, and um, and we did. So we're the MS Alliance of Virginia, and we're small. We're one hundred percent volunteer. Um, we are unfunded, uh, and we were very fortunate that Dr. Jill Kramer, who is the leading neurologist in our area, invited us to join her, and she started bought a building and started our very first MS center in Southwest Virginia, rural Southwest Virginia. That was thrilling to us and it made us feel real. We have several other really cool things we do, but they all come back to the same thing. Education is first and foremost. If you don't understand what you're living with, it's how do you, how do you expect other people to understand? Um, and getting people out is so huge and getting out their family members or their caregivers or other people who love them. And we also are really big on involving our providers. Um, we do programs and our providers uh, come to the programs with us. I always laugh because uh, we have a new doctor in our area now, Dr. Mora, who came here from Florida, who apparently is very well known. And he is starting an MS center at Carillion. There's no competition with any of this, which is wonderful. Dr. Kramer loves having Dr. Moore has come and spoken at our center there. And, um, and I just love saying to people, I dance with my doctor. And he loves telling patients that we dance together. And that's what we do. The first time I met him, I just grabbed him up to dance just like I would anybody at our social events. Um, we now have several groups. We have our little support group in Salem that we start that was there when I started uh, we started a day group um, just a couple of years into our program 
We've had other people with other groups that have asked us how to get involved with us. And it's real easy. There's no big rules. You just got to declare your group to be independent. That way you can reach out to all different kinds of places for uh, funding and not follow the strict rules that some of the larger organizations have for support groups. One of the other things that you mentioned was um, that it's self-driven. Yes, it is. <laughs> and I have to watch very carefully at some of the self-driven group leaders that I've gotten hold of because I have to remind them we're not doctors. Um, we're not here to give advice, medical advice. However, uh, one of my goals has now, one of my dreams has now come true. I remember 45 years ago, a young mother I had a baby at the time um, when I got told I had MS and I was in the hospital for a long while. You used to be hospitalized a lot back then. And I was in the prime of my career. I'd just gotten the biggest promotion I'd ever gotten in my life and had a new baby and life was going good. And all of a sudden I get told I have, at the time it was probable. They didn't diagnose back then the way they do now. Probable was the usual diagnosis back then. But I remember walking out of the hospital and looking up at the sky and going, huh, what now? Or now what? And my dream was someday, because I'd never heard of MS. I'd never met anybody with MS. I thought I had the Jerry Lewis disease at first. And, um, and it was a long time before I ever even spoke to anybody with MS. I, people would hand me people's numbers, but they would get old in my wallet because uh, I didn't know if I really wanted to talk to anybody. And I did visit that one group and didn't want to go back. But my goal when we got the center going was to make sure that we were there, that we had people that are there at the office so that when they're there on the days that Dr. Kramer is there, which is Mondays and Fridays, that we have people there that when that person walks out, first thing they see up on the wall is a big sign that says what now or we can change it around now what <laughs> and then underneath that on the wall I have little letters from people that they've written that tells it isn't a death sentence um, and tells about how either with our group or getting active in different ways can help you live a better life with MS and so that dream's now come true. We now have our office manned on Mondays and Fridays, um, every Monday and Friday. And um, when someone walks out of that office, they can come straight over to us and talk to somebody that is living with MS. We have literature there that we keep on everything. We have um, all the symptoms. Um, we have information on how to get like your uh handicap tags, uh, file for social security, um, housing, um, all different kinds of, of information there, coin vest. And we do programs year round, uh, like as the temperatures get hot, most people with MS have trouble with heat. So we'll do programs on how to deal with heat. Uh, I even found a lotion the other day that cools you down and it really, really does. Those are the kinds of things we share. We're the pros. We live with it. And so if we can go and share these things with each other. We also have now started, we're getting ready to start a group group in Lynchburg. We have, I live in Floyd County and we started our first Floyd County group uh, three months ago. And that's kind of been exciting. It's a small group. So we have a day group. That's a Zoom group. We started it during Zoom. And I was so glad when um, it was looking like uh, COVID was over and I was zoomed out and I thought, well, this can end. But we had a whole lot of people that wanted to keep the Zoom group, uh, people who couldn't get out of their homes, people that live far further away. And we are a small local nonprofit and we know we can't save the world and we can only serve so so much of an area but the zoom group has allowed people outside of our area to get involved we were very blessed 
uh, in December to be awarded a $32,000 grant from Novartis of Equipment and Supplies. The most exciting thing, uh, when they proposed it to us, um, they sent a list of things that I thought I was going to faint because it was things like ball caps and um, weird things. And I was like, if I correct what you're offering to give us, am I going to lose the opportunity for people in our area to get these things? Because this is a wonderful gift, but I just can't see you spending $5,000 on ball caps unless you're going to put my name on them and I can get more people to know where we are. And unlike most companies or organizations i don't want more people i would like to see a day that more people weren't getting diagnosed but people are getting di diagnosed very quickly now and i want people to find us because we're real people living with ms we do not ask anyone with ms for money which is huge i remember the years that other organizations would bang my door down ring my phone off the hook asking for money and I didn't have any money I was having to, I had to leave my career at a very young age which broke my heart because I loved working and um but I always felt like I have something and so I would sacrifice often so that I could give and we never want people to feel that way ever so that's huge to us we don't require anything from anybody and you don't even feel like a stranger. I tell most people, don't worry about it if you've never come before, because a lot of them like me, we don't even remember who was here last month. And don't remember a lot of things. So we'll think you were here before. You'll People act like you've been here a hundred times. So what we do is great. And I think that, you know, I think that one of the things y'all had asked about was, you know, ways that y'all can help us to people living with MS. Um, I know a lot of doctors in the past haven't been really big on support groups, but we do so much more than that. I just wrote a letter to a lady a few minutes ago, and in just in the next month, we have a young lady that's uh, uh, doing a workshop on fatigue and wellness at our office. The Trans Am bike team from Bike the U.S. for MS will be arriving back in Virginia on June the 21st, and they're going to be visiting our office on June the 22nd to meet people living with MS and to do some of our needed tasks that we can't do in our office because we all live with MS and can't really do a lot of the painting and things like that that need to be done. And um, we have social Saturdays where we get together and um, then we have our support groups starting our new Lynchburg group and our Floyd group. And we have a rambling, a, a new River Valley group that goes around. We have a poker run in Hillsville, Virginia on the 15th. So we have things going on all the time. It's not like something that you, you don't have to attend regularly. We have people that never miss a meeting and we have people that maybe come every so often. We had a conference we always have a big deal in march because march is ms awareness month we had a conference this year with almost 100 people in attendance um before covid our last conference that we had we had over 300 people um that's big for a little organization like us but we all work together and um we have great speakers and uh, and we also learn from each other so i hope that I haven't skipped over a whole lot of stuff and I know I've said a lot, but I could talk forever because this is my baby and I love it. And I've seen us make a difference. There's a lady in our group who carries a letter. I'm sorry. There's a man in our group who carries a letter from a lady who's the mother of a young man that we've known since our beginning. And she wrote him a letter telling that our group saved his life. He was suicidal and he didn't know anybody with MS. And when he found us, he felt like he had a new family. And a lot of the people in our group feel that way. They're involved. Their entire family is involved. In September, I will leave with this. 
we were given the opportunity um, a few years ago to take over a respite camp that's been being done for 20 years at Smith Mountain Lake in, uh, in Virginia. It's a respite camp for people whose lives have been severely affected by MS. And severely affected by MS doesn't mean that you have to be in a wheelchair. You could just be like me where, you know, the symptoms come and go. My primary problem is I have crippling fatigue. And that's probably something that even people living with MS that don't have it, don't understand. I don't even understand it most of the time. But our respite camp is a now a four-day weekend getaway. Um, we make it, most of our things are free. We make, I say free, we make them as affordable as possible when we can find the funding. But we always charge people something just so that, I just think that's important that people have something invested, even if it's $10. And um, so when we started, when we took over the camp, we started renting plenty of golf carts. So there's lots of transportation and we do tours of the entire campus and we rent our own pontoon. And uh, our dear Dr. Kramer even went out and got her boating license so that she could be our captain. So she'll t we'll do little uh, little excursions where she'll take out a group of newly diagnosed on a boat trip and nobody's in their business then because they're out in the middle of the lake. Nobody can hear it. It's private. Uh, this year, our, our theme for our uh, camp this year, we've had all different kinds of things. One year, we all got, went, to got, went to Gilligan's Island. That was really fun because we got stranded. Uh, but this year we're going on a cruise to Sanity. And so that ought to be uh, the funnest cruise we've taken in a long time. And it is very sane to find other people that live with MS and to have some time where you can spend with your family and others and um, be around people who get it. And we do really fun things like uh, silent disco, which doesn't give anybody a headache. And um, <laughs> and so we, we find the answers and I appreciate you taking the time to hear about our organization, about me and my journey. Thank you. Really appreciate it, Suzanne, uh, for taking the time. A lot of great information. I saw Sarah drop the links in the chat to your organization into your Facebook page. So we'll make sure those go out as well uh, in the recap, yeah. Uh, a lot of great stuff, um, a lot of cool ideas. So I think there's, a, you know, a lot to marinate on. So we really appreciate it for taking the time and for everybody else joining. I know we're at the hour here, so we want to make sure uh, we're mindful of that. Um, we'll meet again on July 3rd. Uh, be on the lookout for more communications around that. And until then, we will see you in a month. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, y'all. Have a great afternoon.